Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. George's <coughs> Episcopal Church here in Somerville, South Carolina. We're so glad that you could join us today. We'll be waiting a little bit uh, in silence, and then we'll have a prelude uh, that Ward will grant to us before our service actually begins. Um, you may download the bulletin, the all-inclusive bulletin that has song lyrics and uh, all of the scriptures and all of the responses. Uh, and the bulletin can be found on the e-news that was sent out during the week. And also that same e-news edition can be found on um, St. George's Facebook page, St. George's of Somerville Facebook page. Uh, and lastly, it may be found also on our app and on our website. And our website is stgeorge-sc.org, stgeorge-sc.org. Scroll down just a little bit and you can actually find the bulletin for this Sunday there. So I hope that you find it. I hope that you are prepared to give your hearts over to God and worship today. And we will begin in just a few minutes. The Lord will play a prelude for in just a moment.
Send out your light and your truth, O God, that they may lead us and bring us to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Our processional hymn this morning is hymn number 460, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus, hymns one, I mean verses one through three.
Jesus, you know we're going to dance just a little bit. You know, during Pentecost, we were talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was given to us to empower us to do the work that God has given us to do. Has God given you something that he wants you to do? I want you to listen to his voice. And if he's called you to do something maybe you've never even thought about before, sit back and listen to his voice and then tell, tell God, I'm all in. Together we'll read Psalm 100, 
and can be found on page 729 in the Book of Common Prayer. 729. Be joyful in the Lord, all your lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. And his faithfulness endures from age to age. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the time Christ died for the ungodly, indeed, Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our sequence hymn is number 711 in the hymnal, and also printed in the bulletin, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Is this the correct reading? Thank you. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother, Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near to you. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find who is who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, read it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles when they hand you over do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say for what you are to say will be given to you at that time for it is not you who speak but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. That the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Okay, everyone, get comfortable. Uh, get another cup of coffee. Uh, I'm going to give you a moment to make a response to a question that I have, and I'm going to ask Tony to read some of them to me as they come across. And I understand there's maybe as long as this 20 second delay, so we may have an awkward silence or two. But I wanted to ask you this, from this Sunday's Gospel reading of Jesus sending the Twelve out on their missionary journey among the towns of Israel, what do you sense as you hear it? Just tell me what kind of a word comes to mind, what quality in this reading, what emotion seems to come out as you have heard this reading today? And I'll give you a moment to make your responses. I wish I brought my cane and top hat so that I could do a tap dance while we wait. <laughs> that would be quite entertaining, I can assure you. What comes to your mind as you hear the words of this gospel reading? Cure the sick, raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. What comes to mind? Evelyn says uh, preserve, or persevere, sorry. Persevere. Okay, very good. There will be some perseverance that has to happen. Absolutely. Because not everyone is going to receive you when you attempt to minister in the name of Jesus. As we're waiting for some more responses to come in, I wanted to explain what, we, what, what is meant by shake off the dust of your sandals if they do not receive you. Yes, Tony? Carol Privet says relevant. Okay. Relevant to today is what you're feeling, I would assume. The Jews thought that the land of Israel was particularly holy. Okay. I'll, hang on. Uh, can you remember it or do you need to read it right away? No, I got it. Okay. Um, so when they came home from any heathen country after traveling, they stopped at the borders and shook off the dust from their feet that the Holy Land might not be polluted with where they had been. And so it's an illusion there, uh, but that's not exactly what Jesus is telling them to judge them and their ethnicity. He's saying, don't let it get you down, <clears throat> shake it off, and just move on to the next receptive person. If you find one unreceptive person, don't let it destroy your whole day or your whole sense of ministry. Keep going. So perseverance is a very good word. What else do you have there? So we had Fran said trust. Grace says love. Love and trust. Uh, Leone says uh, stay the course of, and have faith. Stay the course and have faith. Very good. And Catherine Mixon says watching. Watching. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, it, normally it says off to the side, watching, but I'm not sure if that's a, a word that she's posting or not. Okay. Anything else? We'll give you another moment. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> when I was meditating on this reading over the past week, I got two things. There are many things that come to mind from this teaching, but I got two primary things. The main things I got out of this reading was the compassion and the urgency of Jesus. Actually, it's even better said by saying it's the urgency that was driven by Jesus' compassion. One reason for the urgency was the need that he saw in the people. To see them directionless and suffering was like an emotional kick in the gut for Jesus. The word for compassion in the Greek is a very visceral emotion. It's called splonthenizomai, where we can almost hear the word spleen from splontna, the inward parts, especially the nobler entrails, they say. The heart, lungs, liver, and kidneys gradually became to denote the seat of the, effect of, of the affections. And so when Jesus looked at the masses after healing all of these uh, sicknesses and raising people from the dead and casting out the demons that had beset these poor people, he, he was emotionally in turmoil watching how helpless they were. And then he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. You see, the people were ripe 
at that time to receive good news. They were looking for good news. Are you looking for good news today? Uh, seems like there's an awful lot of bad news that we see all the time. Are we looking for some good news? I saw somebody say, hey, look, the stock market rose uh, almost to cover all of its losses. And then it went back down a little bit. Uh, the stock market is, is so fickle. And, and, and what we need is good news. Our president is trying to put good news out there so that the stock market can have something to celebrate. And it's just hard to do with things that are going on these days. So they were ready, they were receptive, and they were open. You remember how they were coming in droves to John the Baptist and later to Jesus when he first began his ministry? It's like the strawberry crops around here. They all seem to get ripe at one time. And then without people or laborers to come in to pick them, they'll rot on the vine. And Jesus saw that the opportunity was ripe and he was urgent to get to them. What moved him so was that when he saw those crowds, he saw that they were suffering. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I want to talk for just a moment about these words. Jeff and I like to talk about the Greek words that are in the text because they can, open, they can help to crack open the scriptures and be into deeper meaning. Harris, the word here that's used is ekwiluminoi, those who are harassed or overwhelmed. And I can hear in the kappa lambda construct in that word from the Yiddish verklempt or the German verklempt, someone who is plundered by rapacious men or vexed by those who have no pity. Or in some of the manuscripts, the word eskolmanoi is used, meaning grieved and melancholy. So Jesus saw grieved, melancholy people whose heads were down. And then they were helpless. The eriminoi, which means those who are lying prostrate and scattered about. When you get a picture of an untended flock of sheep, some are over here in the bushes, some are perilously close to the cliff's edge, some can't even make it to food or water anymore. They're lying there looking for someone to help. They were, to put it, these people neglected as to the interests of their souls. And these people were referred to by the Pharisees and one part of John by their words saying this, this people that know not the law are accursed. So they were a people who were disdained, whose needs are ignored by the ones who should be their guides and their benefactors, considered by those very guides and benefactors to be cursed by God. It is to these then that God and Jesus is inexorably drawn with heart-wrenching compassion. And that is good news. Not only for you and me, when we are down and out, when we are hurting, when we are wondering if there's anyone to help, but the good news is that when we turn on the news and we see people who are murdered senselessly by people who think that they are less than them, when we deal with superiority in our society in any way, we know that God is drawn to them with heart-wrenching compassion. And so now we begin to understand the urgency behind this mission. There is so much suffering, and there is so much need in this world. It's overwhelming. As Jesus embraced the suffering of these masses, he did not run from it. You know, some of us, when we see trouble, we run. And others, somehow, when they see trouble and suffering, they're drawn to it. And we call them heroes. He saw that the work was overwhelming. And he told his disciples, please pray that the Lord would raise up laborers for this great harvest of people. Some time ago, I started a, a retail clock shop. I had always repaired clocks, but then we decided to go into retail. And it was right when the economy was having its 2008 fall. It was a terrible time to open a retail shop. But no worries, because people were so interested in getting their clocks repaired that we couldn't pull them back. As a matter of fact, we opened up and we hung our sign. Before we even opened the shop, we had people stopping in the parking lot, and they had clocks in their hands, bringing them to us, because it's like, I haven't seen a clock repair person in I don't know how long. 
And so we had this big room set apart, one downstairs and another one upstairs, to contain all the clocks that were waiting for repair. And then when I finally hired an apprentice, because I had more clocks than I could literally shake a stick at, he brought his little five-year-old daughter into the shop with him, and he said, and, and this, my little girl, is a room where all the clocks are waiting to be repaired. And she went, oh no, because they were all over the place. And she said, Daddy, you're going to need more help. And she was right. Jesus saw as his first priority, it was to embrace suffering. And he thought, I'm going to need more help. Pray the Lord to send laborers into his harvest. This passage is read at many ordinations. Was it read at your ordination, Jeff, by any chance? It was an option for us, and I picked that one. How about you? Do you remember? I really don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Showing his age. <laughs> Actually, we're exactly the same age. <laughs> but whenever I hear this scripture come up in the in the in the lectionary reading in, during the years, I, I re, it reminds me of my very ordination. And I think you can guess why. This particular passage would be used at the ordination of, of a person. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, while proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ is chief among the ministries of the ordained clergy, it does not belong solely to the ordained clergy, and we all know that. Proclaiming the good news of Jesus is the ministry of everyone who is a follower of Jesus. I believe that an equally important ministry of the ordained is to equip the believers for their proclaiming ministries, to be coaches and encouragers of all who have a ministry in this world. If it were up to us, we would be overwhelmed and quickly swamped. And anyone who is a believer has a share in the ministry in this world. And that ministry that we all have is first to embrace the suffering that we see in the lives of others. Trevor Lawrence, the phenom quarterback of the Clemson Tigers, was at a Black Lives Matter rally at Clemson yesterday with all of his teammates and the coaches. And we're all star for sports right now, so I saw a Clemson post on Facebook and I went, yeah, yeah, let me see what's going on. Maybe it's about practice or something like that. No, it was the team and the coaches participating and speaking, black and white together. And it was a beautiful thing that the whole team gathered to support and recognize their black brothers and sisters in this time of awareness. And it was like the white players, they live with their black brethren and play with them and practice with them and they eat with them and all of that kind of stuff. But even with such a shared life, they are now beginning to see a distinct difference in the experience of both races in this country. And it was very deeply moving to see the white players beginning to say, I understand now what you're going through. I don't have to be afraid every time I see a blue light in, the, in my rearview mirror that, you know, we're all afraid, you know, when, when we first see that blue light. Uh, but I'm worried about how much the ticket's going to cost, not whether or not I'm going to live through this arrest. And that's a huge difference between the races right now. So there's this time of awareness that we are in that I think we need to pay deep attention to and to try to throw off our immediate prejudices and take the time to listen, regardless of the rabble-rousers that are thrown into the mix to make things look less than and different than what they are. Discount those and listen to the real message. Well, there was a comment. Of course, there's a comment. You can't put anything on Facebook without there being comments. And one person, he meant well, 
but I could tell that he had not gotten it yet because he said, okay, I get it that black lives matter, but I wish that our team would concentrate on what's before them as athletes and stay out of it because frankly, I've never ever heard at any one time anyone say that black lives don't matter. No, he might not have ever heard anybody say those words. But here's where I had to respond. Because this is the entire point of the whole matter. The few bad cops, and we know, we can see that it's only a few. Thank God for the brave men and women who put their lives on the line for all of us every day. And for the spouses who wonder if their spouse is going to make it home alive that day. We know all that. But the few bad cops with their actions have spoken loudly that the black lies in front of them that they unnecessarily killed must not have mattered to them. And the fact that for years their departments, in many cases, and the justice system behind it all, lean very much in favor of law enforcement. And that's why people are marching. That's why people are protesting. While I was writing this, I couldn't believe it. I posted it. And I saw on TV a report that it had happened again at a Wendy's in Atlanta. This thing runs deep, people. And we've got to spend some time with it. No matter how uncomfortable it is, we have to be like Jesus right now and be drawn with compassion to those who are suffering. To these first disciples on their first ministry mission, Jesus gave them very simple instructions. In verse 9, 35, it says Jesus went about proclaiming the kingdom of God was near. He cleansed, every, he cleansed the lepers. He healed every sick person. He raised the dead. And then he looked at his disciples in chapter 10, verse 1. Now go and do the very same thing that you have seen me do. Proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near. So he says, speak, use your words, and say that God has drawn near to his people. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. In other words, act. Prove these words by your actions. And then depend upon those that you serve. Depend upon them for their kindness and their charity to give you the food that you need to do your ministry. In other words, be vulnerable in your ministry, is what Jesus was saying. So there's an urgency in this narrative about the mission that Jesus was on. As Chuck Murphy used to say, hell is hot, time is short, and we've got work to do. Actually, while hell as a place may well be quite hot. I wouldn't want to experience it myself. I want you to entertain the possibility that it may also, hell may also be empty because Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was more than enough to atone for all the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. If you don't believe me, read Karl Barth. Hans Urs von Balthasar, a Swiss theologian, Pope John Paul II, and notably of late evangelical theologian Rob Bell. But whether you believe that hell could be empty because of Jesus' sacrifice, or if you think that his sacrifice was not enough to take care of the sins of everyone and that some deserve to be there, which I have a little bit of a problem with, but then again, that's just me. If I could hear somebody saying, but Father Chris, if you say that hell could possibly be empty because of the conquering, redeeming goodness of Christ, then why do we preach? Why do we bother? Why do we go on this ministry? From what do we hope to save them then? What we hope to save them from is from the personal hells that they are living in now. Those hells that they create for themselves and those hells that others voiced upon them in every generation, without faith. The 
darkness that causes any of us to be selfish or hateful or gluttonous or racist or craven in any way is the same darkness that has produced the worst hells imaginable from Holocaust to racial oppression, from ethnic cleansing to setting fire to businesses. And the Bible tells in the first chapter of John that the light of God has come into the world, meaning Jesus, and that although the darkness always tries to, it has not overcome that light. As a matter of fact, it's the other way around. And that is the good news we proclaim. God has overcome the darkness. And we need to help people to see that so they don't have to live in it anymore and invite them into a deeper and better life in Christ. Jesus told his disciples to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near. As evidence of that, he commends them, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. The key, I think, is Jesus' compassion on those lost sheep who were harassed and helpless and without God. They were overwhelmed and they were plundered by those with more power than them. They were laid prostrate by the fact that their needs were being ignored by the upper levels of their society throughout history. So, the invitation is, I'm asking you, as your priest and chief pastor, proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Cure every disease. Cast out demons. You know what that means, right? To cast out a demon. To spend time with a person and to overwhelm them with love so that the darkness that resides within has no choice but to flee. Recognize and embrace the suffering of others. Help people to find the true source of joy and peace, which is reconciliation to God and to one another and bringing understanding and healing and resources and, yes, justice to bear wherever we can. Now, some of you may be homebound. Some of you may still be a bit leery about leaving your houses. And you say, what can I do? Well, at the very least, hopefully, perhaps, maybe you could send some money so that my discretionary account can help those who are needed. I never used, I never touched a dime of discretionary money for myself. This has always been for needs as they come in. That's just one place. That's just one way. But what I'm asking, what Kim asked you at the beginning of the song, was to sit back and ask God, what is it that you're calling me to do? Because I can promise you that every last one of you has been given a ministry by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's asking you to embrace the suffering of the people, to proclaim good news to those who are captive to darkness, and to bring healing wherever you can. Join me in that. Amen. Amen. Now, as we turn to the Nicene Creed, I invite you to join us in this ancient statement of faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God, from the true God, be God, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come
come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people, form four, can be found on page 388 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth. Live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Sandra, Skip, Fred, Rome, Ray Louise, Lynn, Jenna Rose, Deacon Bill, Seth, Gail, Garrett, Danny, Anderson, Susan Joy, Sean, Trina, Candace, Celeste, Jonathan, Tim, Audra Ann, Reverend Moore, Elaine, Rebecca, Martha B, Grace, Jim, and all others who we name before you now. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O oh God, we ask that all who are affected by this virus be held in your loving care. In this time of uncertainty, help us to know what is ours to do. We know you did not cause this suffering, but you are with us in it and through it. Help us to recognize your presence in acts of kindness in moments of silence, and in the beauty of the created world. Grant peace and protection to all of humanity for their well-being and for the benefit of the earth. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <coughs> 
most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors or ourselves. We are truly sorry and we don't know your intent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. Forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Understand and greet one another in our forgiven state by the love and compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, and also with you. Peace, Chris. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. Tony. Peace. peace. God's peace, peace everybody. Peace, peace, everyone. God's peace. Well, just a very brief announcement this morning, and that is that um, with the current rise in COVID cases everywhere, where it's going to be a while before we have in-person services, but uh, we are starting to um, prepare ourselves now for some small services where we can have much greater safety and separation. Uh, we're going to be doing that um, not this week, but the following week for a select group of people. And then if you will look on the website and on your last e-news, and which you can also find on our St. George's Facebook page, if you're not a subscriber, um, you can see where um, you can sign up for particular days of the week that you may come to a very small service if you feel prepared to do that. If not, uh, continue to watch us and our antics and everything else that we do here online. But we hope that you're well. Father Jeff, do you have anything for us? Uh, no announcements. Uh, just thank you very much for a uh, truly an inspired sermon. Oh, thank you, sir. All right, everyone. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us and offering and sacrifice to God.
things come of thee, O Lord. And of thy home have we given thee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came, came down from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them in all truth, uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith, and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah! The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. By the tender mercy of our God, the rising sun has broken through to shine on those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet in the way of peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and look upon you with his love for you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn today, our recessional hymn, is number 528. Lord, you give the Great Commission. Verses 1 and 5.
one of us in the power of the Holy Spirit, rejoicing as we go. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. Now please stick around for Ward's postlude and then we'll join you in our program Zoom at the Door.